Good evening, Bethlehem and saints of God. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, or maybe even good night or whatever time you're tuning in to our Wednesday Zoom Bible study. My name is Pastor Michael Eton, and I'm your host for today's study, as well as the Bible teacher. And before we get into the word today, I want to extend this personal invitation for you to join us right here at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. If you live in Paul's Valley and you do not have a church home, or you may have just moved here or accepted Jesus Christ over the radio or television ministry, and all will tell you that after you've accepted Christ, you need to find a church home. So take this as a guidance from God. And we'd love to see your face in this place at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. We're located at 311 North Dunbar. Again, we're located at 311 North Dunbar. And we have literally praying that we see your face in this place this coming Sunday at the 11 a.m. service. As a matter of fact, this Sunday is uh, Mother's Day. This coming Sunday is Mother's Day. And we once again want to extend you an invitation to visit us here, especially you mothers uh, and you are not celebrated. We want to celebrate you this coming Sunday at the 11 a.m. service. And again, we're located at uh, 311 North Dunbar, right here in part of Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. And also, Mothers at Bethlehem. We want to celebrate you. Please come out this coming Sunday, and we want to wish you a happy Mother's Day in Jesus' name. Happy Mother's Day in Jesus' name. Over my shoulder for you first timers is uh, what we do here in our Wednesday Zoom Bible study. It's meant to be a time from 7 p.m. to 6.40 p.m. Central Standard Time. We open up with a word of prayer, announcements, the reading of the word, the introduction video, the Bible study itself, the invitation and the benediction. So let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Shall we pray? Father. We come today wanting to always be reminded that you are worthy to be praised. Hallowed uh, be thy name in Jesus' name. And even as we hallow you, we are always reminded. And we always pray in the model prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all sin and evil. Please forgive us at every thought, word, or deed that we have. Uh, thought against you, Father, and we ask that you cleanse us and wash us, that we might be in right fellowship with you, that we might be in right relationship with you, that we may tonight, this evening, this morning, or whatever time uh, we are watching, that we may hear a word from the Lord. We thank you, Father, for how you're going to work and move today. In Jesus' name, amen. And praise the Lord. Amen. And praise the Lord. First of all, Bethlehem, we want to come today. Sister Eton and I want to thank you for celebrating us this last Sunday uh, as we celebrated uh, 17 years here at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, we celebrated uh, 20 years in full time pastoral service. And we celebrated uh, 30 years of preaching and you, Bethlehem, outdid yourself this last uh, Sunday. You really threw down and it was done in a manner of excellence. And I want you to know that I noticed uh, even the fine details of what you did and it was done uh, miraculously and marvelously. And I just want to say, and Sister I, Sister Etan, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for how you gave. Thank you for how you serve. Thank you for all the good food. Thank you, Bethlehem 
Baptist Church. Thanks uh, to the district and those in our state and national conventions that said their congratulations. And, and we're just so humbled that after 17 years, we can be so excited about someone's leadership after 17 years. So I just want to thank you. And uh, like I said in the text on two occasions, we want to thank God. And we want to thank God's people. And Philippians 1 and 1 says, I thank God for every thought of you. Uh, thank God and good people. So we want to thank you, Bethlehem, for serving. And we look forward to see what God is about to do here in the life of the Bethlehem Baptist Church. We thank uh, Reverend Edward Cochner for being a part of us, as well as our son and daughter, uh, brother Chad and sister Donisha Gray and their church, the First Missionary Baptist Church. And I say that the First Missionary Baptist Church there in Medea, Oklahoma for coming and being a part of this magnificent service. Uh, again, uh, we thank you. I feel like Goma Powell. He used to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. But we just want to thank you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. We want to also remind us, Bethlehem, that Jesus Christ said that my house shall be called a house of prayer. And uh, we don't want to make it a den of thieves or having a priority that's not his priority. Um, this coming uh, Thursday, I'm going to send out the pastor's text and I want you to fast and pray this coming Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And uh, we want to make this place, Bethlehem, a house of prayer. Um, and I want to thank God for answering all our prayers about our anniversary service. I mean, it could have really went bad with all that rain, but after all that rain, God still allowed us to celebrate, and we thank God for answered prayers, for answered prayers. So, uh, Bethlehem and Saints of God, remember, we're fasting and praying this Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., as we seek God's face, we seek God's face uh, for his uh, answered prayers. Uh, we said that we want to add uh, 25 new members in the year of 2024. We want to reach more in 2024. And we've added three thus far since uh, we began to uh, pray and ask God to add the 25. So uh, we praise God for that. That's another great thing that happened this last Sunday. It wasn't just about me. It was about uh, God fulfilling his mission in our church. So we thank God for adding yet another. We look forward to Bethlehem to reach more in 2024 and continue in the series that I started uh, uh, last Wednesday. I started it last Wednesday and uh, we talked about Samson's mother on last Wednesday and, and we're going to continue in that series uh, today as we have uh, entitled this series uh, uh, the I'm Every Woman series, I'm Every Woman series, as we are going to do what the children uh, did and husbands did in Proverbs 31, 28, the children arise, arise and called her blessed and said her husband, and he praises her. And we praise our mothers because our mothers, uh, uh, many of our mothers had to be every woman. And uh, we celebrate these mothers who says that I'm every woman, as it says on this little cup, God's all in me. 
This is the kind of woman that is celebrated in Proverbs 31. I'm every woman because God's all in me. That's the kind of woman we want to celebrate. This month, we're going to look at the lives of women in the Bible, and we're going to learn from their victories and their mistakes. Let me say it again. We're going to learn from their victories and their mistakes because uh, some of us, uh, our mothers uh, didn't live right. Some of us, our mothers made some tremendous mistakes, um, but uh, we're still going to celebrate and learn this month from a sermon series entitled, I'm Every Woman. You remember that song? Uh, I think it was a by, um, I used to remember who it was by, but uh, I know the, the latest one was by Whitney Houston. Uh, who had that song and sung, I'm Every Woman. Uh, there was another young lady. I mentioned it on the first, but I forget right now. But we're celebrating this month. I'm every woman that God's all in me. Last uh, Wednesday, if you missed this, uh, I want you to pick this up. We'll go to our Facebook page, and there's a link at the top of there for our podcast. You can listen or our YouTube uh, at Hear God's Word at Bethlehem.com. And you can go there and uh, click the YouTube and you can find this message, uh, any message we preach, uh, Samson's mother. She was misidentified. We didn't know who she was. But we're so glad that you don't have to be famous, that you don't have to be an Instagram sensation, a content creator, for God to know who you are, and we see how God knew who she was. Today, we're going to look at Eve, who was misled in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at this uh, coming Sunday for Mother's Day. We're going to talk about Mary the Miracle. And if you had a mother, your mother to you was a miracle. We're going to talk about Hannah in misery. Hannah became a mother, but she went through some misery before she would get her victory. I want to encourage those who may be going uh, through misery right now, but I believe by faith God says you can have your victory. We're going to talk about uh, uh, Mary Magdalene, and we're going to talk about Hagar, who was mistreated, and Elizabeth, who was motherless. God worked in mighty and awesome ways in the lives of these women, and this is why they're every woman, because God was all in them. In Jesus' name. We're going to look at it again tonight. Eve misled. Eve misled uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Let me read that in your hearing. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal uh, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, uh, did God really say you must eat from any tree or you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, uh, we may eat uh, fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did not say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, Satan said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. And when the eyes of the both of them were open and they realized they were new, so they sewed fig leaves together and made clothing for themselves. I read to you Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. May God only bless the doers of his holy and magnificent word. Again, tonight, Bethlehem, saying to God, I am sharing a message entitled uh, Eve Misled. And we're going to see how she was misled by craftiness. She was misled by 
cuisine and also how she misled, she was misled by closeness or her husband was misled by closeness and want Christians to know today that Christians should not mislead other Christians. Christians should not mislead other Christians. We're going to look at this uh, brief video, then we'll get into the word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. Amen. And praise the Lord. Amen and praise the Lord. I, I spend a lot of time uh, evaluating the Garden of Eden and Eve and Adam and Eve. And as Genesis is the beginning of, of it all. And I think learning from uh, their lives from the beginning can help us to live our lives in the end. And I've done a considerable amount of research of trying to figure out where the Garden of Eve uh, has been. I've shown several maps uh, showing uh, the possible places of where the Garden of Eve uh, was, the Garden of Eden was. And uh, the Garden of Eden uh, is described in the Bible as having four rivers. And this uh, illustration is just uh, describing uh, where or how the four rivers would look and, and uh, how this was such a fruitful place as we look at the tree of life in the middle of it, how and why it was probably such a fruitful and, and lustrous place was because of the four rivers that uh, ran uh, through them. And there are all kinds of uh, ways that we try to identify, but we really can identify it um, because really today um, the land mass, even in the Middle East, is not the same as it was in the beginning. And so, but we can uh, think and no, but this is the first map I've shown that where it shows a possible four rivers flowing in this perfect place. And we do believe in history, it was uh, in the fertile on or in the fertile crescent. We learned that in our geography classes, the beginning of civil civilization, even uh, secular people believed it began there in uh, uh, what they call the fertile crescent. And, God calls it the Garden of Eden. So 
this is how it could have possibly looked. But in this perfect place, uh, we had a crafty serpent. And the woman was misled by his uh, craftiness. It says, now the serpent is more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And even today, that devil is crafty. He is crafty. As a matter of fact, even in modern day times, uh, I look at my spiritual life as being in a chess match with the devil on a daily basis. And any of you know anything about chess, it's about strategy. It's about seeing uh, your moves. And, and, and many of the masters can name their, uh, their plan beforehand and start and know uh, uh, 10 moves down about what they're going to do and how they're going to beat you. And that devil is still crafty today. And I, I see myself on a daily basis like the chess match is being set up. But the only way that I see myself uh, on that chess match with the devil is that I start out with the devil having me in check. That's how crafty he is. He is a master. And on a daily basis, whether you realize it or not, uh, when you start your chess game with the devil, you start your match in check. He's one move away from checkmate. And the only way you can beat the devil is not by being crafty. The only way you can beat the devil is by being holy. Woo! Let me say that again. Because you can't out manipulate the devil. He's been doing this thing since the beginning. If you think you can out manipulate the devil, you are sadly uh, misled. Hello, like Eve was misled in the garden. You, you're sadly misled um, because he's too crafty. The only thing that the devil can't beat you in, this is the strategy that I use in my, uh, in my chess match against the devil, and this is the strategy of holiness. Woo! Let me say it again. It is the strategy of holiness because that move, uh, uh, that plan, um, is the only way you can win because he, she was misled because he was crafty. He was crafty. Uh, see, Matthew chapter 10 tells us about this uh, strategy match against the devil. He, he says, behold, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd or wise as the serpent and as innocent as the dove. You see, that innocence is the holiness. See, I look at this chessboard every morning and I see what see it for what it is. I'm shrewd enough to see that the devil has me in check on a daily basis. Um, and the only way I can beat him. Ah, uh, it's by being innocent as a dove. That means to live holy. Hello, somebody. Let me say that again. That is to live holy. That's the only way you can beat the devil in this chess match against him on a daily basis. Be wise enough to know that you can't out, out play him in this game, but you can outlive him because he can't live holy. Hello, somebody. That's one thing he can't do that you can do. He can't live holy. Hello, somebody. And, and, and if you're living holy, that means you're being innocent. Hello, somebody. You, you recognize and you see the board. You see the people that the devil has on your board. Ah, but you're innocent towards them. You, 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 you're innocent towards them. Hello, somebody. You're innocent towards anybody that comes against you. When they come against you, you don't cuss them out like the devil wants you to have. And he said, checkmate. Ah, but you pray for them. Now bless those who curse you. Pray for those that, uh, that, that, that misused you. You see, 
Um, the devil has you in check in all kinds of ways because he knows your weakness. He knows you've got an anger problem. So he sends folk on that chessboard to trigger your anger. Hello, somebody. He knows that you have a problem with lust. So he noticed the women that you lust after and he sends those kind of women to you on a daily basis. Uh, and if you lust after them, whether it's through sight or through your mind, or you physically fall or make a choice, then he's got you in. He's got you in checkmate. Hello, somebody. He knows. See, one of the things I noticed about Sister Eton and most people who work in um uh, criminal background histories is they have a superpower. I call it a superpower. They have a, a, a superpower and it's just the ability to observe what's going on. Woo! Uh, and, and, and most of them, uh, they do that, you see, and they and they sit at places. You see, you, most uh, law enforcement people won't sit to their back to the door. They always sit uh, facing the door because they they have to see what's going on. They they don't a lot of them don't park uh, their cars in uh, head first. They back in because they want to see what's going on. See the devil uh, has a superpower and he can see the weaknesses that you have, and he's been noticing you not only before you got saved uh, but after you got saved and. And he knows what you like. He's crafty. He he knows what you'll fall for. If, if, if you have a gambling problem, he knows uh, how to get you to the casino. Uh, if, if you have a less problem, he knows uh, how to put women or men in places where you can notice them. And, and that's how he's so crafty. He serves, and that's why I say every Christian starts their, their uh, chest max with the devil on a daily basis in check because that's how smart he is. He knows your every weakness uh, and he's going to give you on a daily basis what you want. Woo! Let me say it again. He's going to give you on a daily basis. That's how crafty he is. He's been noticing you. Hello, son. And we all know we have weaknesses. You know, for me, anger was a big weakness until God strengthened it. Uh, as I said before in the capping series, lying was a big problem before me, before God strengthened me in that area. Uh, and and, and he, if he knows you lie all the time, he'll set you up and, and have people ask you questions. <laughs> where well, you're going to naturally want to lie. He, he sets you up. For every weakness that you have, he's crafty. And that's why God told him that he's sending you out as sheep amongst the wolves. Therefore, be shrewd or wise as a serpent. The thing about the serpent, too, is that serpents don't have eyelids. They see. Serpents see. Even when they're asleep, they see. Wise as a serpent. That's why you can't allow your dreams to cause you to stumble. Hello, somebody. I told you about a crazy dream I had one day. And the way I got out of that dream was I prayed in Jesus' name because you've got to see in your conscious, your subconscious, your unconscious. You've got to see consciously if you're going to live a life that is holy before God, uh, You've got to come against this crafty old serpent. You've got to see the board of life and see him setting stuff up. Sometimes I see the devil just set stuff up for me. And the only way I can overcome it is to live holy. But Sister Eve was misled. Misled by cuisine. It says when the woman saw that the fruit was a fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for wisdom. You see, if we just look at this in the context of this text, we can think, hey, this was just E. Uh, this was just E. But, but I try to get you to see this in the context of our day in life. And the truth of the matter is, many of us are being misled by the fruit of the tree. 
We've been misled by our diets. Woo! I've often said the only sin that is accepted in the church open publicly is the sin of gluttony. I'm so glad I had to teach this after my <laughs> past this <laughs> anniversary. Woo, we had some good food in there. And I don't mean the metal. But many times Christians are misled by what they eat and it's causing them all kinds of sickness in their bodies. Obesity leads uh, uh, to high blood pressure, the silent killer, which leads to strokes and heart attacks and, and all of that. We've been misled by the cuisine we eat anytime. And, and I learned this fairly recently. And most of you know my, my, my journey to lose weight because the doctor told me I was obese and I always say I didn't think I was obese I just thought I was pleasantly plump ah um, but what she had showed me and told me is that what you're eating is killing you Woo! I remember um brother one of our dear brothers in the church said I gotta stop eating what's eating me hello somebody brother Ray said that I gotta learn how to stop eating what's eating me and, and, and oh, Sister Eve, ah, when she fell to that crafty servant, she was misled by the cuisine. And she saw that the fruit was good for food. Woo! Hey, it, it, this is good for food. This is practical. I, you know, preacher, I'm eating. It's good for food. It's practical. I always say, Everything that looked good to you ain't good for you. And even, and I used to wonder why nutritionists sometimes didn't even want people diabetically to eat fruit because fruit is supposed to be healthy. They say, uh, it's according to how bad you are, how diabetical you are. Uh, well, they don't even want you to eat fruit because it's too sweet. Anything too sweet for you. It's probably not going to be good for you. Woo! <laughs> I mean, not to meddle, but I can meddle now. That's some sweet stuff at Bethlehem when it comes to that Kool-Aid. Woo! Know that Bethlehem tea? Woo! I don't even want to know how much sugar is in it. <laughs> but many times, anything too sweet, that that goes for not just food, but people. My wife just asked me this morning about a book I wrote. And I talk about in my book, uh, Mr. Charismatic. And I say, if he's telling you everything you want to hear, everything you dream to hear, everything that you uh, wanted to know to hear, then nine times out of 10, he's not from the Lord. Hello, somebody. If he agrees with everything you've got to say, nine times out of 10, he's not from the Lord. He's too sweet. Woo. And that too sweet and cuisine will kill you. Hello, somebody. So some folk are having their limbs cut off because of the too sweetness that they uh, decide not to shoot, not to change their diet. It's too sweet, and that's what the devil would do in relationships. He'll cut your legs off from under you because he he was too sweet. He told you everything you wanted to hear, and he led you astray, and you no longer could live holy before the Lord, and you gave your body and your life away to somebody who was too sweet because you saw that the fruit, hello, somebody, looked good for you for food, for the food of a relationship. You were starving, and, and you decided to go with Mr. Charismatic. Hello, somebody, because he was pleasing to the eyes, it says in the text as well. As well. And also the, the, the desirable of gaining wisdom. He was smart. Almost every woman you want to know. Always say they want a man that can teach them something. <laughs> 
And the devil got some wise brothers out there that's going to teach you about everything except living holy before the Lord. That's the only way you can defeat Mr. Charismatic. That's the only way you can defeat uh, even the problems with our cuisine is you've got to live holy. The Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God and we should put anything in it oh that will destroy it and i've said many times before people teach pre teach or treat that table in front of the pulpit more holy than they are they won't put anything on that table but in this temple they put alcohol they put drugs they put and I'm talking about over alcohol and drugs that are not healing. They put all that kind of stuff in their bodies. Oh, because they're misled by cuisine. Ooh, some misled by that stuff and the people that look good for them, that are pleasing to the eyes and that are, that are desirable for wisdom. I think they call it a sapiosexual. Ah, uh, you got you got to teach me something. Oh, yeah, God, the devil got some sapiosexuals for you, but they're gonna lead you astray. They're gonna lead you to astray. Now let's get back to this cuisine thing because uh, Daniel teaches us a lot about that cuisine and life. You see, uh, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. How did he resolve not to uh, defile himself? See, Daniel didn't have a problem. With high blood pressure, he didn't have a problem uh, with diabetes. He, he didn't have clogged uh, arteries uh, um, because of what he drank and what he ate. He resolved not to re uh, uh, defile himself. You say, preacher, how was he resolved not to defile himself? Did it mean he wouldn't go uh, to prostitutes? Does it mean that he wouldn't gamble? What was he resolved? He resolved not to eat with the raw food and the raw wine. You see, anybody else would have been there. They, hey, they were like, hey, this is the raw steakhouse. Hey, this is the best winery. This is good stuff. I'm going to eat this. And they say also, uh, by the way, that that food could have been sacrificed to idols. Hello, somebody. That makes a lot more sense why he resolved not to defile himself because the food was sacrificed to idols. And, 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 and he made this resolve. And like I said, holiness, because holiness is the cuisine, is a cuisine, hello somebody. He, he resolved not to defile himself. He resolved not to eat from the king's table, and we've got to do the same today, Christian folk. We've got to do the same in our church. We want our church. We want to reach more in 2024. We're going to reach more Christian. You see, the problem with the pastorate and why pastors, we try to stick together on our anniversary dates and try to celebrate them. The biggest problem with pastoring is, is that it's hard to pastor people who are eating, hello somebody, raw food and wine. It's, it's hard to pass the people who have defiled themselves, uh, oh, by this world. And, and many times, most of our churches have more unsaved folk in it than saved folk. And this has caused us, oh, to have a big problem when it comes to pastoring. And that's why many pastors have a problem, why pastors don't last. I think they say average. I, I know from my school, they, they did a statistic and they said that, and, and, and these are guys with the learn, uh, train with, uh, with masters and doctorate degrees. They say they don't last three years in the ministry. Why is that? Because we're trying to pass the people who have defiled themselves. And it's hard to pass the people who either not saved or who don't act saved. Hello, somebody. 
But 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 Daniel said, "Hey, I, I know I'm in a foreign place. I'm in a foreign land, uh, and and this is why God tells us to be ambassadors." ambassadors live in a foreign place in a foreign land but they represent the land that they come from the problem with most christians and churches today is that they are not ambassadors they are citizens of this fleshly world they are citizens uh, of the devil hello somebody but then you say hey i'm going to be an ambassador and i'm not going to resign i will not defile myself that's what uh eve's answer to the crafty devil and i told you that this, oh, that this chess game of life, the only way you can win is to live holy. Daniel lived holy in a foreign land, lived holy where they were sacrificing this food that was sacrificed to idols and, and wine, but he lived as an ambassador. Hello, somebody. And, and that's what Bethlehem has to be. It has to be Oh, a place where the ambassadors for Christ hang out, where the ambassadors come together to encourage uh, each one in, the, in our life of faith. It cannot be a place, oh, that is set up like the temples in this world. Sadly, I heard about another preacher who failed or who didn't fail but made some choices because it was a pattern. You see, that 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 it, it, you can't pastor without resolving yourself. Oh, preacher man, oh preacher, what you cannot pastor unless you resolve to not defile yourself. Hello, somebody. In Jesus' name. Talk about the craftiness. We talked about the cuisine. And lastly, because I'm already out of time, talking about today, Eve misled, misled by closest. And this is what we got to get this thing right. You see, it says she took some of it and ate it. Okay, if you decide to defile yourself, defile yourself in your own privacy. If you decide to defile yourself, allow it to be your own personal decision. But what she decided to do is to, oh, mislead that one person that was close to her. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Ah, oh, he was misled by closeness. That's why you can never allow anybody to be closer to you than God. Now, you've been around and heard my ministry for 17 years, and I'm high on God and family, and I, I'm, I'm high on, on family. As a matter of fact, my, my latest book, uh, Black Love Must Matter in the Bible is a book that is encouraging us to get married, live holy, raise holy children. But if you allow that person you marry to be closer to you than God, then you will be misled by closeness. It happens all the time. See, because on that great chess game of spiritual warfare, the devil's going to use those peace, those people that are closest to you to get you to stumble and fall. Those people that are supposed to be holy, those people are supposed to love you. It's going to be the ones that are closest to you that's going to mislead you. As a matter of fact, Oh, if I turn up dead, the first person they're going to look at are the people that are closest to me. Because it's usually those that are, that's why you can't let Oh, people to get close, even between a, a marriage relationship. I know you married for 50 years, but you can't allow it to be a dysfunctional 50 years where you've loved your mate more than you love God, because what's going to happen, and this is shown up in the fruit of a lot of folk, marriage is if one died, they both died. That shows they were too close. Ooh, let me say that again. 
the preacher, now you merely you getting it to. I said, if one died and they both died, that meant that they were too close to one another because if God took your mate, that means that, oh, he was finished with your mate, but he wasn't and is not finished with you yet. And if you decide to give up on life, if you decide that you can't live any longer, that means that mate for 50 years was your God. That means that mate for 40 years was your God. And when you lost your God, you lost your will to live. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. You better learn to live on in Jesus' name. Because the devil will use that in the great uh, uh, spiritual uh, warfare to get to you the closest. Ooh. Some of you weren't married that long. You were in a relationship. That relationship was really good and the devil took it because he's trying to take you. And you are ready to die. You weren't married oh, for 50 years, but you were in a relationship for 10 years and that person decided to leave and now you're ready to die. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Don't allow the devil to use those who are closest to you to cause you to stumble and fumble away from God. In Jesus' name, this man knew the right thing to do. And that's how the closeness in your close relationship, when you know the right thing to do, somebody that's close to you can lead you astray. Woo, I said something there. Don't allow the devil to use those who are closest to you to lead you astray, Adam. You know the right thing to do. And you know, uh, Christian folk, you know, I've been living for the Lord so long that, and I was thinking about this yesterday. I wasn't even thinking about my sermon when I thought this. I thought, that I am my own worst enemy. Because it's really not the devil. You know, Flip Wilson say, the devil made me do it. No, many times he didn't make you do it. He just presented what you wanted and you decided to take it. So the onus is on you. Hello, somebody. The onus is on you. He probably was thinking the same way she was thinking. That's why I say if, if you're in a relationship and y'all don't have the ability to disagree, it could be a dysfunctional relationship. You shouldn't both be clones of one another. Hello, somebody. You should learn and know how to think independently, especially about the things of God, the word of God. If your mate thinks different than the word of God says, then you should be able to manifest the truth of God in your life, even if it's not in your mate's life. Hello, somebody. Like say, if your mate don't want to go to church, guess what? Don't you stay home. You get up. And I tell men all the time, your wife don't want to go to church. You get up, you get those kids ready all oh, to go to church and you take them with you. That's what my pastor, Pastor Darn told me, uh, 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 Darn told me, oh, over about 30 years ago. Hello, somebody, you go. If your mate don't want to go, you go to a three o'clock service. If your mate don't want to go, you go. If they don't want to go to prayer meeting, your mate don't want to go, you go. If your, mate, your mate don't want to sit in on, on Zoom meeting, you go. Hello, somebody. Don't allow your closeness to lead you astray from God like Adam did. Hello, somebody. You have to have an independent relationship with God to live holy or else he would use those who are closest. Have you ever noticed Bethlehem? How at one time your whole family was in the church. Oh, but now you're the only one. You know why and how that happens is because the devil is trying to use those who are closest to you to get you to stumble, to get you to stop. But don't you dare stop in Jesus' name. You go. Hello, somebody. 
You walk on, you live on, and that's us, us as a church as well. Because there's some folk in our church that are no longer coming. And I know how close you are to them, but they're no longer coming. I know that you eat with them. You go out with them. Ah, oh, man, because what the devil is trying to do, he's trying to use the closeness of your relationship with them to get you to stop coming and serving the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. In Jesus' name, why will I fellowship with folk that are not fellowshipping with God? Oh, ooh, I said something now. Ooh, I probably need to close on that one. That, that may have been too hard. That may have been too hard. Why should I fellowship with folk? And, and we ain't talking about uh, building a bridge. These folk were in the church. We're not trying to uh, talk about uh, 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 they know Christ has been shared. They were a part of the church uh, uh, for 20, 30, 40 years, and they ain't coming no more. Why would I, hello, somebody, fellowship with somebody who's not fellowshipping with God? Hello, somebody. They know the word like you know, but they're living unholy and ungodly, and the devil is trying to use those those who are uh, closest to you uh, to stop the real growth of the Bethlehem Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, we're going to reach more in 2024. We got to stop allowing those who are the closest to us to lead us astray, to take up our time, talents, and energies. Hello, somebody. I could really get deeper, but I better close out. I better close out. I, I feel I want to say something here, but it's, it may uh, need to be said in private. Um, but I've already said it. I just want to say it in a, another way or a plainer way, but I'm not feeling led to say it because I've said it. Don't allow those who are close to you. I don't care if you've been friend 30, 40, 50 years and even friends in the church 30, 40, 50 years. Don't allow them to lead you astray. And don't spend time with them. Woo. And that's why I say uh, many times people treat the church like it is a social club or a country club. Um, it's not a country club. The church is really supposed to be exclusive. I don't know where we get it should be filled with thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. The church is an exclusive group. And the people are there are supposed to be Christians. A Christian means Christ-like. People who are living Christ-like are supposed to go there and be encouraged and inspired. And God has really rearranged and changed the life of our church, and he's trying to make it a place of, for Christians. And we must be in close relationship with Christians, because if not, the devil is going to use or try to use your close. Some of you may think, yeah, well, I'm strong enough. I can be around them. They're not going to lead me astray. Well, you know what? I don't think I'm strong enough. Ooh. Say, preacher, but you've been living for the Lord most of your life since you were 19. Oh, no, I don't think I'm strong enough. No. But as the Bible said, pride comes before the fall. Ooh. No, 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 I don't think I'm strong enough for anything. As a matter of fact, I told you on my spiritual warfare, uh, the chessboard of it, I know when I wake up, my life is already in check. Hello, somebody. 
And I know the only way that I can win is to live holy. And the only and, and, and the best way that I can live holy is only be around folk who live holy. And I'm not talking about evangelism and building the bridge and all that. No, I'm talking about there's some folk, the bridge has already been built. The whole city been built. And they still not living holy for the Lord. But each uh, or Adam allowed the person that was closest to us. And this is what it says. It was not Adam who was deceived. He wasn't deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. That's why I could say that, hey, I'm not all that strengthful. I'm not all that holy. I'm not all that strong. Because Adam wasn't deceived. He knew what he was doing. He was influenced by the closeness of his wife. Don't allow your wife to get closer to you than God. Ooh. Don't allow your husband to get closer to you than God. Don't allow your children to get closer to you than God because these are the people that the devil will use to try to get you to stumble and try to get you not only to stumble, but to become a heretic. Ooh. I said enough, Bethlehem, and I'm already, what, 14 minutes over time. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And I said what I was talking about. Christians must not allow, allow other Christians or other supposedly Christians to mislead them in Jesus name. Before we close tonight, I always have to share this, this verse that never gets old to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you are here today, you're listening either through uh, Facebook, YouTube, we're, we're out on everything I know to be out on. If you're listening uh, through in any of that and you feel God tugging at your heart, I want you to pray this simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe today that you are God's only son that you died for my sins, was buried and raised again on the third day so that today I may be saved. So that today that I may not be misled by the devil. So that today that I may win this spiritual warfare or chess game for my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. And praise the Lord, if you pray that prayer for the first time, and you're anywhere near Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, and you've been born into the body of Christ right here at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. And as a result of that, we want to see you this coming Sunday. If you pray that prayer for the first time, we want to see you this coming Sunday. And it just happens to be Mother's Day, so come on out and bring your mothers with you. Tell her, hey, we want to celebrate you today. Go to the Bethlehem Baptist Church and we will accept you when I finish preaching. Come down and let me know that you pray to accept Jesus Christ and we will accept you into the body of Christ right here at the Bethlehem Baptist Church. We are located at 311 North Dunbar. Again, we're located at 311 North Dunbar and we'd love to see your face in the place this coming Sunday once again, which is Mother's Day. Bethlehem, we want to see you and all the mothers this coming Mother's Day. We're so excited uh, to celebrate mothers. And once again, Bethlehem, we want to thank you for what you did last Sunday um, and how you celebrated us. And we thank God and good people. Shall we pray? Father God, we come right now. Just want to thank you and to praise you and to glorify your holy name. Father God, put your hedge of protection around us. Keep us safe from our harm and danger until we meet again. And the people of God said, amen. And praise the Lord, Bethlehem, you are dismissed in Jesus' name.